So today I have the privilege of talking about Assistec, which is actually a work that's done by uh, scores of my students over the period of last 10 years. And what I'm going to present today is our, first we'll talk about the products, but more importantly, we'll also talk about our journey where I think we have something created that how do we take student projects or work that actually happens as part of the curriculum, how do we actually translate it to products? It's a no, complex process, but I think there's something for it for others to learn from it. And that's the, that's the story that I'm going to talk about today. So the first product that we talk about is a smart cane. So this is actually something which was launched on 31st of March 2000. Uh, 14. So it has been around for roughly now two years. And it has, uh, we'll talk about, show the functionality of the product first through a short video. So what originated as a user specification of safe mobility so when we talk about visually impaired, one of the challenges that they face, especially in unstructured environments like what is provided in countries like India is, there are lots of objects which do not have much footprint on the ground, but they project onto the path in which the person is walking. It's very common to find trees, which are actually the root, uh, the uh, trunk is outside the footpath, but actually the branch comes. When a sighted person is walking, he just comes and ducks and walks across and you know, avoids hitting the tree. Similarly, when we are using something like you know, window air conditioner, room cooler, all of this use this in our houses, we you know, just put this, but imagine a visually impaired person who is walking with a cane and he is you know, just going to tap on the ground and all these causes upper body injuries for visually impaired people. Basically motivated by this, at Assistec we decided to create a product and the product essentially is to avoid need to head obstacles. It warns the users through, uh, it's an ultrasonic ranging device, through a set of different tactile patterns, it warns the users regarding obstacles that are present in the path. So now let me talk about the next product, which is actually a, uh, something that we have designed for visually impaired to port, board public buses. So what you see is what device we call it as an onboard. So typically when a visually impaired person wants to board public buses, something that all of us can expect is that how do they find the route number of the bus? Go to a bus stop in Delhi, you could have 50, 60 bus numbers coming onto the same stop. And the buses keep on coming and how do I find the route number? But what is more challenging, that is something a sighted person actually cannot visualize, is more than the route number which you know, a co-passenger can help them with, the challenge remains, where is the entrance of the bus? Where is the door? Because the buses stop in a range of, we don't have a system of a strong bay. Buses stop in a range of around 50 meters. So governed by this, we decided to uh, create this uh, device. It's an integrated device which helps a uh, user not only to find the route number of the bus, but also to actually get an audio cue which allows the user to walk towards the uh, entrance of the door. So you will see that in this particular video. So this actually video is taken in Mumbai, where we installed this on 25 buses, on all buses plying on two route numbers over a period of almost three months. And large number of users actually boarded this bus and gave their user experience, which was extremely, uh, you know. Uh, so this is the user device, and the user device has uh, basically just uh, two buttons, a query button and a select button. Query button essentially allows the user to collect the route number of all the buses which are in the vicinity. They come uh, to this device through a radio link. And once the device comes, uh, the route number comes, it allows the user to select. If the bus route number is of interest, then the user can select the route number and uh, can get an audio cue from the speaker that is actually present uh, on the bus to be able for him to be able to walk towards the bus. So that's the second device. <laughs> so this is actually a user actually boarding the device. Device called refreshable braille display. How do I, uh, no, today the content is becoming all digital. More and more content is actually becoming digital. How do I actually a visually impaired person access digital content? 
Audio is one preferred method. Audio is also a very economical method. They can actually listen to digital text. But unfortunately, if you are only listening to text all the time through your education, it's not possible. If you cannot read, you cannot write. Reading and writing are sort of the two faces of the same coin. You have to be able to read to be able to write. So only education through audio is actually also problematic for the visually impaired. It has to be supplemented. Traditionally, this was done through braille pages. So you have this printed braille and you know. But when the content is digital, how inconvenient it is that each time I want to read, I actually have to print. Of course, you can do it through audio, but if you want to actually read by, you know, uh, through Braille. So this, for this, there are something called refreshable Braille displays. Refreshable Braille displays have been around for a long time, but they have been extremely expensive and absolutely unaffordable in the Indian context or even in the context of other devel developing countries. Very small number of Braille display users you will find, though we have the largest visually impaired population in the world. So we have decided, designed a very low cost, affordable, and still full featured Braille display. And it's at the prototype stage. And we'll talk about it. it will, it's likely to. So you can uh, show the uh, video for this, which will, you will see that how the Braille prints are. Uh, so what you see is a navigation method. And what you see the keys on top is essentially the keys which allow a person to also make take notes in Braille. You can also uh, you know, <coughs> use this as a note taker. And this uh, dots moving up and down create the Braille character. And this, is, uh, this particular video is taken of this display communicating with a mobile device through a Bluetooth uh, interface. Okay, so you can uh, use it as a note taker. You can use it as a display. You can you know, uh, do even you can send messages through this, SMS messages or emails through this. And, you know, this has been tested. It's actually available as a prototype today. But we are hoping that in a year's time, we would be able to get to a stage where it will actually reach the end users. So continuing with the uh, area of education, let us look at another uh, technology. I won't say a device, another technology that we have been working on. Have you ever thought of how do a visually impaired person access diagrams? Braille is present for text. But as soon as it comes to figures and pictures, the solutions are very complex. Again, this problem has been the same. It is not that the solutions did not exist. The solutions exist, and globally, if you travel in, in Europe or in US or Japan, these countries have what are called tactile diagrams available for, I would say, at least for the last three decades. But unfortunately, because of the cost of those tactile diagrams is so high, it has no penetration. So typically, what happens in India is when a textbook is produced for a visually impaired person, you just print the text, remove the pictures, and he just gets the Braille text. This is what is the, currently that's what is happening. So imagine reading a textbook with a large number of pictures. It says figure 5.3, but there is no figure 5.3. How do you actually expect a person to understand this? So we started looking at, the focus has been on creating affordable solutions. We started looking at how do we create these tactile diagrams. And what you see is a map of India labeled with the states and so on and so forth. So again, this uh, particular approach is based on using the, you know, let's say, widespread uh, uh, spread of uh, 3D printing. So now using, we've created these molds for using 3D printers. And using thermoforming, then we actually create these pictures. So earlier, because the 3D printing was not so widely available, so this technology was not possible. And today, we have a very affordable solution for uh, pro, uh, you know, producing these tactile diagrams uh, so that we can also do a mass production. Thermoforming has been used by visually impaired schools in India, but they have been only in the local sense, in the sense that there are always special educators who will make some tactile diagrams for their students. It has never been a production technology. So what the breakthrough that we are trying to achieve is a production technology, just like books, it should actually be available as uh, books which the users can use. Uh, so this is an example of a tactile map which we have produced for NCRT and it's being distributed across the country for feedback.
So before I go to the next part of my talk, which is one of the key focus that I want to talk about, I will just like to show the devices that we talked about in terms of the prototypes. These are you know, the smart cane devices that we talked about. And today there are roughly 10, more than 10,000 users of this device, 12,000 devices have been actually sold both in India and uh, 12 different other countries. It is actually available under the ADIP scheme of Government of India. That means that the people from economically weaker sections, people who have visual impairment, they can actually get this device free. So it's a Ministry of Social Justice scheme. This is a device that, uh, the bus ID device that I talked about. This is a user device. Now we have a more compact version of this user device. And this is a device which was installed on uh, Mumbai buses. We had more than 94% success in the person boarding the first bus on his or her route, unaided by anybody else. The third is this uh, refreshable braille display. This is the prototype of the display. The final versions we expect to be even smaller as well as lower power consuming than this. So what's common between them? So I talked about mobility. I talked about education. As I said in the introduction, we consider mobility to be even more fundamental than education because mobility is required even to acquire education. You need to be able to go to the school. You need to be able to go to college. Of course, uh, education is very fundamental to any type of inclusion. So that has been the focus, and I already talked about these uh, four devices. So it's very clear that what is common is all of them address, they are all assistive technology devices which address the needs of the visually impaired. But is there anything else that is common? And that's another point that I actually want to make. This is, I think, is very important point that I want to make that all these things were initiated as undergraduate class products, projects. That means that the first time when the idea came and first time when we started working, some undergraduate students took upon itself that, yes, we will like to build this and test it. And what is more important, of course, these are not the only projects. We have done hundreds of projects with undergraduate, and I'm sure all the institutions do hundreds of projects with undergraduates. But what was different was these boys and girls who did this project as undergraduate, they become highly passionate about what they are doing. They not only continued to work while they were in the institute, they have continued to work many times even after they graduated from the institute. They have come back. They have repeatedly come back to the lab. They have stayed back in the lab. They have sometimes not taken up very, very <coughs> let's say, lucrative placement offerings. They have continued to stay because their dream, their passion of being able to make an impact match what we were actually trying to achieve. So this is something that is absolutely important in this particular space because if this space is such that it is not only technology that is important, in a lot of times, it's also the user inputs that's important. Very, very simple thing. When we were designing this, Somebody came up with the idea, should we bother about the color of the handle? So the immediate reaction was, when you're talking of a visually impaired person, how does it matter what color of the handle you have? You know, this device could be any color. But first time when we talked to a visually impaired person, his reaction was, do you wear clothes for yourself or others to see? That sort of answered the whole thing. All this is not enough. Designing in the lab is still not enough. Then you need to reach to the field. And field requires partnerships. It also requires funding. We struggled a lot with it. Today, I think we have achieved a credibility that we are able to draw funding. And getting into that credible position is difficult. But we have partnerships in terms of how do we actually take this. And partners like Phoenix Medical Systems at Chennai, Critical Solutions in Noida. These are industrial partners. And we get them into the project very early on. It's not that ownership of the industry is also as much important as ownership of the designers and the innovators. So we get them into the project at a stage where the labs and the you know, initial field trials we do ourselves, but beyond that, when the prototypes are getting manufactured, they are part of it. And that's the model that we are uh, essentially. And so I will end with, so our dream is to touch a million lives by 2020, and that's the dream as a stack works. Thank you.